Welcome to Hello Self. It's a podcast focused on turning your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. I am your host, coach, and author, Patricia Leonard. Welcome to Hello Self Podcast. I'm so grateful to have you here today, and I know you're going to learn a lot. Hello Self Podcast is focused on helping you get those dreams and goals off that someday shelf and turn your cans into cans and get on that runway to success that you've dreamed of for a long time. I'm your host, Patricia Leonard, coach, author, and a little bit of everything, as you'll learn over time as we go on this journey. I'm very excited today for the guest I have. You're going to learn so much, and you're going to feel like afterwards you can do anything. If you've ever wondered what your purpose and passion is, well, let me tell you, this guest that I have today, has he's here to tell you there are many passions that you can follow because he's done that. And I'd like to welcome Terry just before I give a little overview. And then I'm going to ask him to share uh, his story, his story of his journey in his corporate and personal life. So thank you, Terry Warren, for being here today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yes, great. We're going to have a great time. So I'll give you just a few highlights of who Terry Warren is, simply from his resume, but he will tell you the truth. So Terry has, he's been in corporate America as an executive. He decided then to go into consulting and coaching other executives. He's also got a passion in serving. He's been on nonprofit boards, faith boards. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I met Terry, it was at International Coaches Federation here in Nashville, Tennessee, and he was the president. And I was impressed with the way he was put together and the way he run um, the organization. And I suspect, even though I did not get to witness it, I suspect that his consulting was right along that same line, very direct and helping individuals move. He he uh, teaches in uh, serve, um, excuse me, leadership to top executives in corporation. Um, he's an author. And this is something that I really liked. I didn't know. It's funny. You can know somebody for a lifetime and not really know them. He is the author of a book, The Art of Choice, and I'm going to ask him to speak about that too. And um, this is the one thing that just blew my mind. He is a landscape artist, a very successful one. So you're on a great ride today. So enjoy it and soak it all in because you may say you've got a lot of passions too. Doesn't mean you can't follow most of them. Maybe... Uh, it's different points in your life. So let's turn it over to Terry Warren now to tell his story of anything about his life and career that he thinks could be helpful. Terry, I'll give it to you now. Thank you, Patricia. So just a little quick background about me, if, if I may tell you a story. So uh, I grew up in a really small town in Tennessee called Hohenwald. And at the time, the population was about 3,600 people. Oh, wow. And I, uh, my parents were wonderful parents, hardworking, uh, uneducated. Uh, neither of them finished more than the fifth grade. Yeah. And so they were hard workers. And um, for some reason, I was the last child. <laughs> and my brother was a senior in high school when I started first grade. Yeah. So in some ways, I was an only child. My mother worked in a factory, and my dad did whatever it took to earn money. He was a carpenter, painter, um, anything, you know, to, to earn money. Uh, but he passed away when I was 14. Oh. And so I had to do a lot of work to help, you know, my mother. But I got to tell you a funny story from my dad as a carpenter. 
So I used to go with him on the job to try to help him. I think he was primarily babysitting, um, <laughs> but I tried to help him. And I remember my dad always said, son, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be a pencil pusher. Oh. And I thought, well, that's what he means by that is he just doesn't want me to have to work so hard as he does out in the heat and the cold and, you know, whatever. And so, okay. Uh, well, as I got to be an adult and have my own home and started my own projects, I realized what my father was actually doing was protecting me from myself because he knew I would starve as a carpenter. <laughs> That's great. Because I, I couldn't drive a nail straight. <laughs> but how that influenced me and in, in a hello self moment, I guess, was, so how do you get to be a pencil pusher? Mm. And it was like, well, after some research, it was like, I guess you got to go to college. <laughs> but no one in our sort of long history had ever been to college. So how do you do that? And I did a little research and found out that if I could go to school, this tells you how old I am, Patricia. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, that if I could, if I could get fifteen hundred dollars for the, I could go to Tennessee Tech in in Cookville, Tennessee, yes. for one year for fifteen hundred dollars. Oh my goodness! And so I went to my mother and I said, "Would you be willing to co-sign a loan?" Scared her to death. Yeah. <laughs> for two reasons. One is um, she had just the idea of being on a loan for $1,500 on what she earned scared her. Yes. The second was she was very about being equal with all the children. And so I've never done anything like that, she said, for the other children. And so I don't know if I can do that for you. Thankfully, she talked to my brother and sister and they said they supported it. Yes. And so she did. And so I got to go to college. And I knew that as a combination of what my dad was saying, you know, about being a pencil pusher and my mother, knowing she was on a loan for me, I felt compelled to find a way to pay for school. Uh, and so I did. And I went through a, what's called a cooperative education program at Tennessee Tech. So I'd go to school a year, work a year, and I paid off the loan. She didn't have to be on any more loans. And I earned my way through the rest of uh, undergrad school. And then I decided to go to grad school and had to earn my way through that as well. So um, a lot of things became possible that I didn't think were possible. And I do believe that my parents' work ethic and their mm -hmm. desire, you know, really helped, but they needed me to go do something, right? And so I did. Um, and so it was like really a, a guy from a family with no education yeah. got a master's degree. How is that possible, right? And then you fast forward many years, and I was working for a company that sent me to Paris, France uh, for a business trip. Took my wife with me, and we're sitting at the top of the hotel uh, for a drink before we go out to dinner. And I looked at my wife, because I'm looking at the Eiffel Tower. Oh, wow. And I said to my wife, how is it possible that a boy from a small town in Tennessee could be sitting here looking at the Eiffel Tower for real. And I don't know, Patricia, if that really was the moment, but it was a moment at least mm -hmm. when I began to understand there are a lot of things that are possible mm -hmm. that I never would have thought possible. Mm -hmm. And there were many other things, you know, like that, you know, throughout my career that just proved to be possibilities. And um, fast forward to I'm approaching the end of my 40 plus years in corporate America. And I'm not a retiring type. I just, no. I'm a type A, <laughs> yes. you know, I got busy. And so what did I do next? I had no idea. So I spent about a year just talking to people, researching. I find, by the way, I find that's a valuable thing to do anytime. Talk to a bunch of people, get input, put the pieces together, then figure something out, right? So yeah. I did this research, and one day it clicked that executive coaching was the way I wanted to go. So I went to my company and said, hey, I'm going to pay for me to go back to school 
I want to earn this credential, but you got to give me some clients to help me earn the hours I got to do. Wow. Which they did. Yes. And so I coached a little bit internally and then I stepped out on my own, you know, when I retired from there and began coaching. But another important, so one important moment was making the decision to go with coaching, right? Is what I do now. By the way, I've been doing this for seven years now on my own. It is the best thing I've ever done in my entire career. Hands down. Yes. Um, so, um, so I did go back to school. I did do this coaching, but here was interesting, Patricia. Um, you know, I went to coaching school and they teach you a way to coach. And I really wanted to coach top level executives. Um, but the truth was I was scared mm-hmm. oh. because, um, you know, did I have enough experience? Did I, was I good enough coach? Would they want to work with somebody who's only been out of coaching school for like two, three years, all of these doubts. And I did the smart thing. I hired a coach. His name is Stephen. <laughs> McGee. And I got to tell you a funny story about Stephen, but this is one of those moments that you talk about. Hello self. Yes. So um, remember, I want to coach executives, but I'm, I don't have the confidence to do it. So I'm having a conversation with Stephen, and he said, tell me a little bit about your background. I mean, what, what have you done over all these years? And I said, well, you know, especially in the last several years, I've usually reported to the CEO of the company. Uh, well, did they ever talk to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sort of found me as a, <laughs> you know, a confidential resource, willing to listen to whatever they, and they knew it would be confidential. I wouldn't say anything about it. Mm-hmm. So you were trusted. Yes, I was trusted. (laughs) He said, I'm confused. These are the very people that you've been working with, but you're afraid to coach them. How is that possible? I said, well, you know, coaching, you got to do it a certain way. And he said, what if you stopped believing that? Mm. He said, what, how would you distinguish service from coaching I said oh service that's easy I said because of that I, I can do that all day long because all I got to do is show up you know listen and try to be available for what people need at that moment and he said then what if you stop thinking about it as coaching and you thought about it as serving totally changed my mm-hmm. mindset I got off the phone and called my former CEO and said, I would like to be your coach. He said, okay. He said, okay, right? (laughs) Uh, And so I'm, you know, I get off the phone. I'm so excited. My wife said, what's going on? And I said, he's totally given me confidence. She said, for 30 years, (laughs) I've been trying to tell you, you undervalue yourself. You have one conversation with a guy and you're now confident. Mm -hmm. I said, yes. Yes. Because he changed my perspective. Oh my gosh. He gave me a new lens to look through and I know how to do this. So in part, I think in order to be able to do something that you may now think is not possible, is you need to find out what lie am I believing Mm -hmm. that I can stop believing. Mine was, my lie was, I had to coach by formula and people might not find me capable. I had to stop believing that. Isn't that amazing how we go through our own journey And we're learning as much as we are giving out. I love what you, the the things that you have told in your story, Terry, are exactly what people are asking of themselves, their own confidence. I had a client this week, uh, past week, that um, is in, I'm not going to say what, but has a, a CPA. She's a CPA. And um, she wants to get into something else, totally different career, 
totally different interior design or fashion design very different so she didn't see competencies that she could have but the thing that you just said that you know the competencies that she had gained in corporate america that could help her move forward in that same career because you're right we get a perspective that cpa is different than design yes there are some different things in it but what i liked what you said and exactly what we ended up doing in her first month strategic focus was to talk to somebody in the interior design business mm -hmm. and you just said that another thing that you taught our audience which i absolutely love is ask for what you want. You ask your mother for $1,500 and you didn't know and your mom didn't know, but you got it. And if you hadn't asked, it might, you might right. not have gone. We don't know what might have happened, but you would have had to, but you stepped out there and asked. Make another, uh, you said at retirement, I made a hello self moment that I want to coach executives but I don't have the confidence. So many people listening and so many people, as a matter of fact, you just gave me more confidence in just stepping out because I'm new to podcasting. So you gave me more confidence. So we never only learn one way. It is not a one way. And perspective mm. is so, because we can think, you could have thought because your family didn't go to college, that um you wouldn't either and uh, then you could have said well how am i going to push pencils which you did say that i'm very interested but anyway you gave so many lessons for our people and i wanted to make sure so for our listeners and i wanted to make sure that they caught those strategic things because those are so and the moment that you were in paris looking at the eiffel tower you said, I could never have imagined this for myself. And that is exactly what a lot of people, what holds them back. I could not imagine that I could be doing this. I could not imagine. You made your journey feel so real on this side of the listening. And I, I, I'm so excited about what you've said. Now, um, I want to ask a couple of questions because I know... Um, you've given me a life story now, but where we are, maybe this is more society and culturally focused. And um, what I'd like to ask you is, how do you see corporate America is changing today? What are some of the things that you see and specifically the leadership at the top? Well, I think one of the things, you know, crises create a whole lot of interesting outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the outcomes of the whole pandemic thing was that leaders had to learn how in the world do you build um, sort of this cohesiveness mm -hmm. when people are scattered. Mm -hmm. They're not together around a coffee machine. You can't have a company picnic. You know, you can't. How do you keep people engaged? And they had to find new ways to do that. And the other thing that I think, which is very important to a, a top leader, is because the meetings were like this, uh, people were more vulnerable mm -hmm. in their appearance, in the fact that a dog is barking as they run through the house, or somebody forgot to put a shirt on as they mm -hmm. were walking behind your camera. Mm -hmm. And I found with the top leaders I was working with is in a sense, it made them more accessible okay? mm -hmm. because people were seeing them in their environment, in their family. And, you know, I've had several clients who had little children come up and grab them around the neck when they're going, I'm sorry, I'm on a call, you know, it's yes. Well, daddy, I got to go. You know, it just opened them up. Mm -hmm. And I think that was very important because I have a, this is my belief. Yes. And I, and I think I've proven it through my clients. And my belief is I was asked on another podcast one time, what is the number one thing that you think leaders 
need to learn? And my answer was simple, self-awareness. Because I see that as a derailer Mm -hmm. of corporate careers. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, it's a derailer for many of us, regardless of what we do, is that we really don't understand. We may have a good understanding of who we think we are, but we may not understand how we come across to other people. Yes. And for leaders, especially, that that self-awareness is really important to mm-hmm. get. And it's hard to get. Yes. Because people want to look good for you. And they're certainly not going to come back to you and tell you all your warts, right? Yes. So gaining self-awareness for leaders is important, but I do think through the pandemic that vulnerability also was mm. good. Does that help you? Oh question? yeah, that's right on exactly what I was hoping to get. And I think it built a level of trust between the leadership and the employee too. They had to be, you know, naturally they could see that the work was getting done. But at first, I think there was an issue with trusting that we could be productive as an organization and have people working out of their homes. You know, um, yeah. I think it's very interesting. When you were telling that story about leaders, uh, it reminded me years ago, I had a workshop on communication at Capital One and um it was, I dressed up like a magician and you kind of know me, I'm a little bit of everything, I'll do anything. And (laughs) I asked the uh, trainer, the corporate trainer, if it was okay. And I said, this is the way I want to do it. So I dressed up as a magician and it was in uh, Ohio and it was a big atrium and uh, all glass. And at lunch, I saw a group of men, mostly men with white, shirts and suits walking out. And I said to this one gentleman, uh, have you had any magic in your life today? Now, remember, I had a magic hat on and I had a wand in my hand and the tails. And he said, oh, if I did, the rabbit would probably run off and I wouldn't be able to create any magic. And I said, well, why don't you come to my workshop this afternoon? I didn't know that he was a VP of that particular bank. But guess what? He came. And it was middle management um, and he showed up and they sh- they were shocked to see him there. So was I, actually. And <laughs> um, I divided them up into two groups, one, two, one, two, so they couldn't sit by their buddy. And uh, I said, they're going you're going to be two groups from um, Broadway. And these are Broadway shows, and you need to put on a show for what communication really means. And you're going to do it for the other group. I had taken a bag of rags, and I had taken um, a CD. I mean, that's, this was a few years ago. Taken a C. I still do these, but st- uh, taken a CD, and the CD was ain't she sweet. And um, so I said, go back there and get out any garments that any of you want for your chorus, for your group to demonstrate what communication is effective. So the gentleman took his coat off. He had a suit on, I mentioned. And there was a wig in there, a woman's wig. And there was a bikini and there was a string of pearls. Now, when he turned around, That's what he had on over his suit, a a wig and a string of pearls. I still got the pearls here. And um, the rest of them were standing in a chorus line behind him. And he had told them, you stand back there and sing the song and I'm going to dance. This man stood in front of the line and danced. Then we processed it and said, how what did this mean communication wise to you would been shocked no you wouldn't have been shocked it was amazing what they said that his presence had made in effective communication and the fact that he was going to be vulnerable and when he walked out of the room he had to go to a meeting and he turned around to the group it was about 25 people 
And he turned around in the group and to me, and he said, this is the best training I've ever had. Well, first of all, when we started, I said, have any of you been to a communication workshop? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I said, well, are you slow learners? And so at the end, he said, I've been to a lot of communication workshops. This is the best one I've ever been to. We we tend to put flip charts up and it's just um it's just something that they see but when you're like we are right here and we're talking and you said we're vulnerable that is a different thing for senior for any uh, people running businesses i think so you're right yeah. uh, the pandemic um, with all the sadness it brought it helped us to become more human i think um okay yeah. I want to, um, young leaders, what would you say to young leaders? Because I hear a lot about them being, oh, they're really different today. Um, what would you say, what advice would you give to young leaders? And I, I loved your story of how you integrated in, but what advice would you give to some of the young leaders today that are just entering either entrepreneurship or corporate America? Well, I, actually, I can give you a couple of things. Okay. One is one of the things I do is, uh, and I think you know this, but uh, I coach first year MBA students at Vanderbilt mm -hmm. uh, at the Olin Graduate School of Management. Yes. And interestingly, one of the topics that comes up with them, I'd say there are two. And so I'll give you a quick on two. One of those is um, fear of speaking up in class what? and i'm like here's a bunch of brilliant people why would they be afraid of speaking <laughs> exactly. up exactly but, but it's but they're like everyone all the rest of us fear of looking stupid and so um the basically the, without because we don't have a long time is simply to say one of the things i suggest to them is when you're young and you're trying to sort of break in good questions are a great tool so i have them pre-create a set of good generic questions that they could ask in any environment mm -hmm. and literally have those in front of them at all times and if they're in a meeting or they're in anything like that look for an opportunity and pick one of those questions and just ask it so you're not trying to give your opinion you're asking for input because what I have found by people giving input who are a little afraid to ask for it, right? they cause a group to ask more questions. They cause a group to think. So there's really a contribution mm -hmm. that they can make to a company, even though they may know nothing yes. about what's even being discussed, but powerful questions, just like for a coach, but just good powerful questions is tell me how you got to this conclusion mm -hmm. what was the process that mm -hmm. you've done to do this uh, I know I don't understand anything about this topic but but could you tell me just a little bit about this aspect of it yes yes questions like that are really helpful yes the the, uh, the other thing that we go to and by the way I find this for young people and really people of all kinds yes. is <laughs> I want them to focus on what is unique about you. Ah. What is it that you bring to the table? So it's not your education because every one of you in this graduate school is going to have the same education. It's, is it your experience? Yeah, a little bit. But if I have two pieces of two resumes in front of me mm -hmm. and on paper, both are equal. Mm -hmm. Why you? Mm -hmm. And that's a hard question. Yes, it but is. it's an important question because it's it's important for you to say that if you take me or if you make me a leader or if you do, you know whatever with me, here's what you're going to get mm -hmm. that you're not going to get from somebody else. You know, for me, it is the, one of the things is I can build relationships quickly. Mm -hmm. And here, as evidenced by, you always got to have that, right? 
yes. proof. Yes. Uh, are I love to pro solve problems, but let me tell you how I approach solving problems mm -hmm. that's different from the way other people may do it. Mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of people. I do. So the idea of realizing you have something to contribute and contribute it through questions, identifying what's unique about yourself, what makes you different that you can articulate mm -hmm. that would apply no matter what industry or anything else. You notice the two things I said, I didn't say what industry it was. Yep. It doesn't matter, right? So that would be two, two little yes. pieces of advice. So if you just brought up something that, uh, and I know we're winding down here, but uh, something that is very important because hello self suggests conversations with self. And it's very important for us to be, the, just to know our uniqueness. We have to have a conversation with ourself prior to going out there and having conversations that are meaningful with others. Because if we don't, we're probably going to put ourselves down. So learning yep. hello self is uh, uh, really uh, having conversations with who do you think you are? Who are you? Are you afraid? If you're afraid, what can you do? So it's really getting clear about how you feel and your perspective, just like you brought up earlier on something and you can change your own perspective um, just by simply having a conversation. Yes, I like yeah, that. And, and Patricia, I think given how you started this and, and what your Hello Self stuff is about, I'd, I'd like to offer one thing. Okay, great. Because I think this is about possibilities. Yes. Right? So I did this look back at my practice and what clients have been able to accomplish. Yes. Um, that they accomplished. I didn't do that. Right. Which then led to that book, The Art of Choice. I love it. Um, because change is a choice. Right? So I'm going to give you a statistic that uh, is pretty interesting. And the statistic is this, when I coach clients and when I interviewed people for the book, here's what I found, that people who made an intentional choice to change something or to do something, mm -hmm. so it's gotta be intentional, mm -hmm. right? Number one. Number two, they gotta really commit to it. Mm -hmm. And when I say commit, I mean, jump off the cliff kind of commit, right? Yes, yes. Um, commit to it. And then the third is being oh. willing to be held accountable. So intentional choice, commitment, being willing to held accountable. What I found with clients and the people I interviewed is when they did that, the success rate was 100%. Mm -hmm. I have a master's from Georgia Tech, but it doesn't take a master's from Georgia Tech to figure out 100% is a good number. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's funny that you bring this up because that was the last thing I was going to bring up is your point about commit, of, first of all, intention, commitment, and then the uh, accountability. I was going to bring that up because you got where you are today because you did those things. I mean, you did it, and I know you interviewed others that did too, but you did it. If they look at the story you told today, you intentionally wanted to go to school and get a be a pencil pusher, and you asked for it. And then you committed by getting in school and going and then taking the next step. And you became accountable for making good grades, creating your own business. So you followed that art of choice. And I think that people, it's not about lip service, as um, I hear. It's about actually walking the walk and stop right. talking the talk. Terry, I, this is beyond my expectation. I've had more fun than probably anybody listening. And I've learned a lot because... Some of it's con uh, confirming how I believe or affirming how I believe. And another part of it is a reminder in me. And that's what Hello Self is about. Waking up those moments in us where we may have fallen asleep and allowed our life to go on a back burner or to get in a comfort zone and not move forward when we have goals and dreams that we want to live yet. So the way I'd like to close this out 
is uh, let us, if you would, let us uh, give us your website. Is there anything that you've got planned for the future? I wanted to ask that too, specific. Because we didn't go into your landscape painting very much. Anything, any uh, other thing? Uh, no, the uh, in painting, the plan is just always, it's got to be better. It's yeah, be better. I, I saw a, that you, in your notes too. I'll sometimes you never arrive. <laughs> That's good because you know what? That's a driver too for right. us to say, I always want to, yeah. It, it, it yeah. doesn't always stop us. I think what you're saying, it didn't stop you, but you uh, always want to make improvement. And that's what the journey of right. life is about. That's what life is right. about. So what I'd like to do is now tell us how we can get a hold of you, whatever that is. If you're open to senior con uh, to do more uh, senior consulting or any kind of coaching and consulting, just tell us how we can reach you and uh, where we can get okay. your book. Yeah. Well, you can get the book at Amazon or on Audible. It's it's both a um, there's an audio version and a and it's called The Art of Choice by me, Terry Warren. Yes. It's actually called The Art of Choice making transformational changes in work and life. So it applies not just to corporate America. Um, so it's there. But uh, for my coaching, my website is uh, warrenexecutivecoach.com. And then for my art, it's terrywwarren.com. And his art is beautiful. Go check it out because it, it, it'll take you to the spot that he's painting. So I want to say thank you and thank you to my audience for being here today. And I'm sure you had a lot of ideas that stemmed inside of you just by listening to his story. Again, I'm your host, Patricia Leonard, and you can reach me if you'd like to be interviewed or you have questions. All you have to do is go to www.patricialeonard.net. Or you can email me at Patricia, Len Patricia at PatriciaLeonard.net. Thank you and have a fabulous rest of the day. And don't forget, keep dreaming. Thank you for joining Hello Self today. And may it offer insight and inspire you to stay on your runway to success. Like, share, and subscribe. And remember this, keep dreaming.